everyone, and welcome to tonight's SD Media Pros meeting. We're glad you're here. Um, we're going to get started with our regular programming tonight in just about 15 minutes. Tonight, we're going to be talking about film distribution with Scott Valentine. But first, I'd like to introduce Mark Masonov. He is a member of our board of directors, and he has put together the news you can use for April 2021. Take it away, Mark. All righty. Thank you very much. I think we will go right to the news here and uh, make sure we get the right screen here. Let me know that you are seeing everything. I should be seeing the screen. Yep. And uh, so wonderful news you can use this time around. And we are just going to. And why is it? Because it's, it's lovely news. And what do I mean by that? Well, who doesn't love free stuff, right? Aren't we all in love with free stuff? But what is going on with this free stuff? Well, let me tell you, Pond5 introduces a free collection. It's all free. So if you're looking for stock footage, they have videos now, photos, and music. That's all free. So you have thousands of complimentary HD and 4K clips, images, music tracks, uh, without having to pay for worldwide distribution forever. No purchase necessary. It includes more than 3,000 inspiring videos uh, that they have to the images and the music tracks. And their weekly free clip offer uh, increased the exposure and the income of to 10% of the featured artists. That's kind of why they're doing this. And the free collection aims to build on that success, offering participating artists this broad exposure to millions of Pond5 customers around the world. And of course, who doesn't love exposure? Because with exposure, well, you get exposure bucks. Well, and everyone loves those exposure bucks because they're accepted everywhere. Nothing is sold. So if you want some exposure bucks, be sure to get that. But I, I joke, it's a great program. Look at Pond. They've got some decent stuff there. You really want to see it because seeing is believing when you get to Pond. And really, it is. Or is it? Is seeing believing? I'll tell you. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. Who can forget this cinematic marvel, the, the Return of the Jedi? It's a plot that's been described as a group of teddy bears. They form an army and stop a futuristic KKK. And the cinematic or climactic battle scene at the end uh, features a duel to the death between an aging father and a son with daddy issues. So uh, take a look. Awesome, right? I mean, that's 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 tremendous that that we have that. So, what's the whole point? Well, you saw something, you know, it's a classic. But is seeing believing? If Madison Avenue crowd had their way, the ending may look something like this. That's right, product placement with Bob's prosthetics. They could shoot, soon be coming to classic films. What's going on? Well, for those of you who don't know the product placements, it's about as old as the industry itself. First started in a Buster Keaton comedy uh, where he showed logos of petrol films and motor oil companies. But if we fast forward from way back then in 1919 to 2019, we now see that product placement is worth $20.6 billion worldwide across TV shows, music videos, movies, and films. That's a lot of dough right there, folks. And while previously the product had to be physically actually there when you were doing the film, the advertising industry is now turning to technology that can seamlessly insert computer-generated images. And one of those uh, companies is called uh, Myriad. That's the one out of, out of the UK, where they say the technology can read an image. It understands the depth, the motion, the fabric, anything. So you can introduce new images that basically the human eye doesn't realize have been done after the fact, after the production. And here's kind of what that looks like.
phenomenal. And for those of you who are NASCAR fans, you now kind of see that uh, Hollywood's becoming nascar eyesized here as we start putting all these ads in the movies. And for some of you, that may hit a raw nerve, but for others, well, I would say, ooh, baby, I like it raw. And what does that mean? What does that got to do with anything? Well, Color Finale Transcoder is now available. What is, what is that? Well, Color Finale is a new extension that uh, you, lets you edit raw straight away in Final Cut Pro. Instantly preview, you can adjust settings for uh, B-RAW, Airy raw Cinematic DNG, previously not available to Final Cut users. You can control lots of things that go white balance ISO and other camera specific parameters. So on, on behalf of the Premiere Pro users, we'd like to welcome you to the future, Final Cut Pro users. It's, uh, it's great to have you. You're going to love it here. It's really cool, the things you can do. Here's a little peek. That's great. You guys right. Final Cut Up now has these wonderful, uh, wonderful tools that they can get in. I know Mike Tao is experimenting with it, and it's, I think, finding some uh, good success with that. Uh, as we as we move on, that's here, but there are other things that are gone. It's done. And what do I mean? Well, this, sir, uh, this story has a bit of a ring to it. It's because I've talked about it before, but now it comes full circle. Okay? Stop me and get stuck in a loop here on this What's up? What am I talking about? Well, the theatrical window is gone for good, but creators gaining greater power amid the streaming wars. And I'm sure Scott may speak a little bit about this as, uh, as we get into it. But the idea is that, according to James Murdoch, the former 21st century Fox CEO, he says that there's a complete collapse of the, of the theatrical window where we allowed films to be played exclusively in theater before they were released for streaming. That's, that's gone. It's something exhibitors have fought for decades. The streamers now are replacing that void, creating a very competitive situation downstream. And according to Murdoch, if you're not one of the top three choices, what are you really? And, and he has a point. I mean, to be able to get in some of the top three, that's very competitive. However, this shifts the value proposition upstream, which opens more creative avenues to independents who look to hold on to their creative rights rather than selling them off to forever. So this shift is not bad because you know what they say shift happens and that's that's kind of what's going on here with our theatrical windows unfortunately bad shift happens too and kind of an in memoriam section here we'd like to say rest in peace to charles geschke now uh, for those of you who don't know and probably most of you don't know uh, charles geschke has a big influence on what we do he was co-founder of adobe and he has passed away uh, he he co-founded it with John Warnick. They developed the groundbreaking software that revolutionized how we create and communicate. He instilled a relentless drive for innovation in the company, resulting in some of the most transformative software, PDFs, Acrobat, Illustrator, Premiere Pro, Photoshop, stuff we probably all have used or have heard of. Uh, he began working at Xerox and the Palo Alto Research Center, where he met Warnock, and they left the company in 1982 to found Adobe. And in 2009, President Barack Obama awarded Geshe and Warnock the National Medal of Technology. So uh, may his soul rest in heaven, because there he may get a front row seat to what's happening next. And that's space, the filming frontier. So what, what the heck is going on here? Is that Elon Musk in the back? Well, yes, it is. What does that mean? Well, there's a company called Space 11 that now looks to produce all content in outer space. What, what's going on? Well... Veteran film producer Andrea Iverlino is jumping in the Galaxy game with the launch of Space 11. Uh, Space 11 aims to produce film, TV, and web content, as well as live events like concerts and sports competitions, all filmed in zero gravity. I'm sure Kevin Baird, I saw you, you're going to love this. Kevin, this is where you need to be, baby. And he's partnered on the venue with experts from Elon Musk's SpaceX, as well as Agal uh, Hussein International Center for Astronomical Sciences in Sicily, and expects the first project, believe it or not, to launch to be a sporting event with prep starting this summer. Now, I, I, I can't confirm it, but I, I, so far there's no word if the moon will be considered out of bounds. Don't know that. And ladies and gentlemen, that is News You Can Use, April 28th, 2021.
Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Hey. Back to Very you, Very good. And a lot to take in, Mark. Oh, my goodness. I'm sitting here shaking my head about a whole bunch of those ideas. Exciting. And no, don't ruin my classic movies. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> Well, thank you for this month's news you can use. Uh, we'll post, uh, our, if there's some links, we'll post those on our website so that uh, you can follow up and take a look at some of those technologies a little bit more um, if you'd like to. Any thoughts from the audience about anything that Mark shared tonight? Anyone else as terrified as I am about uh, that product placement idea? Well, they thought colorizing. An abomination. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff <laughs> Lehman, Jeff Absolutely. Lehman. I think it's a great idea and I'll tell you why. Because as independent producers of content, and like I'm working right now on an, uh, as soon as we can, we're gonna be shooting an independent film. Before, if you wanted product placement, you had to go out to these sponsors and get them bought in before on the whole concept. And these, and you really never could get money because um, they, they, they weren't quite sure what your film was gonna be, no matter how well you explained it. And um, and if they did buy in on it and say, oh, this is going to be positive for, for our brand and yes, we're in it, they wouldn't give you much anyways by using that as an excuse like, oh, maybe it's not going to turn out that great. You know? But now if you can go back and you have this great little rom-com or something like that where it fits well with the brand, you can put all the, that stuff in afterwards when they can see the product and you say, hey, you know, Talk to Coke, talk to, you know, the competitors, say, I've got this thing, it's going to be hip, we're going to be showing it at film festivals and stuff like that. And it's a much better way to get sponsors than the way we've had to at, up to this point. And um, as far as I'm concerned, too, with We Can Explore, I mean, mine's a nature series and stuff like that, but... Who knows, you know, maybe there's a, uh, we don't have cars or anything like that, but maybe there's a building where, you know, we, we'll uh, put in somebody's uh, local brewery or who knows what we might fit in there. I don't know. I think this is a great thing for independence. I don't know if I want it in my classic films though either, Jane. <laughs> well, and I can tell you, if you put a billboard in the middle of Yosemite, I'm going to just revolt. Jeff. No, 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 no. Nothing. I was teasing really about We Can Explore, but for independent films, I think it could really open doors to, you know, some substantial money that we never had access to before. Only big movies had access to before. Because mm -hmm. if you shoot a nice tight film and you're not that well known, but, you know, you're starting to gain some traction, even after it started to gain traction, you can go back and get those sponsors where that certainly wasn't a possibility before. Great. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Good. Good. Anyone uh, else want to jump in? Or if not, um, I think I'm going to transition us into the program. Um, Tom, do you want to stop the YouTube feed, feed and start again? No, we usually keep this on there. I will just keep it rolling then. Yep, we keep going. So do you want to do polling or do we want to do uh, just the minutes? Um, I think what we should do is, first of all, introduce tonight's program, but very briefly. Um, for those of you who may have just tuned in a minute ago, I'm Jane Hare. I'm the president of SD Media Pros. Thank you for being here tonight. We are going to be talking about film distribution with Scott Valentine, who is a Hollywood actor and business entrepreneur. Uh, and he is in the midst of developing a new OTT over the top streaming platform called Red Coral Universe. That, in, with, and the intent is to give independent filmmakers uh, an avenue to show their work. So Scott is here. He's going to be talking to us in just a few minutes. And beyond that, you may recognize Scott Valentine. He was on the 80s TV show Family Ties as Mallory Keaton's boyfriend, the artist. And uh, I don't know about everybody else, but if you watch that show, he is one of the ones who cracked me up every week. So we are very happy to have Scott here this evening with us. And we're going to get to him in just a minute. Uh, and speaking of just a minute, I actually did not write that as a transition. It just sort of happened. Um, we have been asking for you to submit some 60 second video clips. And tonight we have three. These are very brief suggestions from you about uh, how to use technology or whatever is on anyone's mind and expertise. So Tom, you wanna roll the first just a minute? 
I certainly will. And I need to spotlight myself first to do that. And first, we will bring on Mr. Uh, Greg LaFave. More and more producers want drone shots in their films. And for good reason. Drone shots are great as establishers or short interstitials or simply to take the viewer where they cannot go. But do it safely and effectively. Let's take those in reverse order. The drone shot must contribute to the story, not be a distraction. A beauty shot you can't take from the ground or the view from someplace where you can't place the camera. But safety is critical. Drones are moving objects with sharp spinning blades. Use a checklist and your first questions are, license, does your drone operator have the latest FAA Part 107 certification? Is it legal to fly in that location? Insurance, we're talking about specific drone related coverage. And has the drone operator flown that drone for that kind of video in that kind of circumstance? Keep those practice runs and retakes to a minimum. I'm Greg Lafave. See me at gregdrones.com. Uh, thank you, Greg. There we go. And um, let's just roll right along. We have another one here from uh, Julianne uh, Valera. Hello, my name is Julianne Valera. As someone who's participated in the casting process, it seems as if some newbies don't understand that film festival potential does not equal film festival eligibility. As some people will fly across the country without asking or researching the following questions. Are you okay with doing a film that will not be entered into any film contest and or festivals? Are you okay with doing a film that won't show up on IMDb? Does the production company that's doing the film meet all of the qualifications necessary for film festival eligibility? Or are film festival entry fees factored into the film's budget? What are the statistics regarding unknowns winning awards at each film festival? What film festivals allow non-union films? If this film festival allows student films, do the films need to be from a school that has a whole film department or will they accept all student films? For the places who do accept student films, figure out what film festivals only allow thesis films or films by graduate students. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Julianne. And one more from our very own um, Mr. Kevin Marty. Hi, my name is Kevin Marty, and I would like to share with you a little tip that I discovered. You know, we end up with a lot of stuff in our bags, and sometimes it... Whoa! I wonder how long that's been in there. We end up with a lot of wires, especially long wires, thin wires. Well, I discovered something that'll help you with managing these type of wires. Just take a bag of coffee, it doesn't matter if it's caffeinated or decaffeinated, and you begin to open it and you'll see a tie there. Just pull it off. You'll notice that the tie is a little bit wider and it's a lot stronger than a tie like, say, from a bread wrapper. You can take this tie and use it to wrap up your wires into a nice neat bundle. Well, I hope this helps and you can use it sometime. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I was hoping to see the dog take a bite out of that sandwich. <laughs> a man has a sense of humor. I love it. I love it. Um, so those are our um, jam, getting our jam on our just a minutes. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Um, if you would like to submit a just a minute, we would like to hear from you. It's very simple, 60 seconds. Uh, shoot it with good production quality to represent you and media pros and uh, submit it to membership at sdmediapros.org. And we're planning to show three of those every month and then also post them on our social media. So it's good visibility for you to talk about something that may be an area of expertise. And uh, maybe we'll get another one from Kevin Marty in the future and find out if the dog really does take a bite of that sandwich. So, uh, Tom, can you bring up the gallery view for just a minute? I um, believe it is up right now. Is gallery view up right now? Yes. Fantastic. Um, I want to grab, if I could, a screenshot of our audience this evening. We always like to post these on our social media. So if you don't already, maybe turn on your camera if you dare. And uh, I'm just going to grab a quick screenshot, and then we are going to move on with the program. All right, everyone, here we go. One, two, three. All right, three takes. Got that, thank you very much. 
Um, one quick announcement, SD Media Pros is an educational nonprofit and the information that we're presenting tonight is for educational purposes. And when we get into Q&A tonight, we need to stay away from talking about things that may be in any way political. So um, thank you for that. And now quick introductions of our board of directors, and then we're gonna get right to Scott Valentine. Um, I'm Jane Hare, the president of SD Media Pros. Robin Martin is our vice president. He was not able to join us this evening. Um, Bob Unger is our CFO. Uh, Jeff Trober is our webmaster. Kevin Marty is our director of membership. David Raines uh, is part of our technology department. Mark Masonov, as you've seen already, does news you can use. Tom Kinneman is our streaming guru and Michael Wood does our social media. And now I'd like to introduce Jeff Trober, who is our webmaster. Um, as a member of the board of directors, one of the things that we each do is um, produce the meetings. And this month, Jeff came up with the idea of having Scott Valentine as our special guest. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to do the introductions and then moderate our conversation. So take it away, Jeff. Okay. Thank you very much, Jane. And uh, welcome, everybody. And it's kind of a little reunion tonight for uh, Scott and I. We go back to, uh, as we mentioned during our uh, pre-meeting pre talk about uh, going to Adirondack Community College. And I see some other friends from uh, our cue and curtain players at, uh, in the, the theater group at the college, uh, Ellen and Sue and Robin. Uh, so welcome. Good to see you virtually. But um, we want to welcome them. Uh, we were all together doing college uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, doing theater in college. So um, introducing Scott. Scott, welcome. It is great to uh, to have you here and to uh, see you again. And I'm going to put this on gallery view so I can see everybody. There we go. And um, let, me, uh, let me read Scott's bio that he sent me. And uh, for those of you who don't know Scott, and um, we'll give you a little introduction. It says, based in New York, Scott Valentine has over 15 years of experience in the field of financial structuring and business consulting for various industries, as well as 40 years in the entertainment industry. After a successful career in the entertainment industry as an actor, he segued into the business side of the entertainment industry. He has an extensive history in the development, production, and distribution of film, television, and streaming content. As an executive producer and the owner of his own production company, Scott held development production deals at major networks and major production studios. Scott branched out into the renewable, sustainable energy, power delivery, and other developmental markets as both an equity investor and independent investment banker in 1999. In 2003, Scott became a managing partner at Merit Capital LLC. He left Merit Capital in 20, or 2005 and became director of Excelsior Capital Partners. With a focus on the renewable energy sector, to date, Excelsior Capital Partners has been responsible for structuring over $1 billion of project financing. Scott attended Adirondack Community College in Skidmore while residing in Saratoga Springs, New York. And after two years at those learning institutions, Scott moved to New York, where he attended and graduated from the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And I want to note that Scott went through a three-year program in a year and a half there, which is incredible. Throughout his acting career, Scott has acted in over 75 films and television shows, as well as Broadway and off-Broadway theater productions. So with all that, Scott, welcome. It is uh, great to have you here tonight. And um, I hope the snow has finally gone away uh, back home. <laughs> How dare you say that, Mr. Trober? You know, it snowed four or five days ago. It's just, and it may snow again on Friday. Yeah, you gotta I love know. It. I, I know. I don't. I As I tell people when they ask why I live here, I said I don't have to shovel sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. I've got to say, before we jump in, I got to give a big hug and a lot of love to Ellen Sue and Robin Wells. I love you, love you, love you. I'm so surprised you guys are here and I'm just, I'm giving you a big hug, big kiss. And, and, and it's so good to see you guys, so good. There is Robin, <laughs> hi honey, hi. <laughs> My fiance has to talk to you about being an air traffic controller. She's, a, she's an air nut, so we can talk about that offline, okay? And Ellen Sue, you look marvelous. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. Now, Jeff, 
There's a thing. Are, are you going to tell anybody about the Agatha Christie production we did up at uh, ACC? <laughs> <laughs> The upstate wall falling, Mr. Valentine losing his lines. I never knew that Agatha Christie wrote that oh shit in her dialogue, but uh, it was in there that night. Uh huh. <laughs> we had some adventures. <laughs> yes, we did. We had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. We we sure did. And um, so let's, let's just talk a little bit about acting. Um, when you started <clears throat> studying acting, um, you know what 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 was your impetus to 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 um, get into acting? What what uh, was your uh, what? Well, you know, really, it, it, sparked? it started at ACC, and the fact I think in my first semester I had a resounding one seven GPA, and in the second semester a one three two, and uh, I heard they were having auditions for this play, and I thought, what the heck? Why not? Let's try it. And uh, I had auditioned for the play, loved it, got a part. I can't remember what the first production was but quickly realized that the research that I was doing for the play was the same research that I could apply in the same uh, uh, knowledge that I ascertained to certain term papers and theses that were due for different classes. So I just wrote up the same, you know, the same information, put a different title on it, and did one in for lit class, one in for civic, uh, whatever it was, civic history. And um, in addition to that, I started to uh, create this great, network, this great family of friends that I uh, I'd always had a good body of friends, but it really the the theater troupe, the curtain, what, what was it? What was our Q name? Curtain. What was it? We were Q and Curtain. Q and Curtain players. We became a family. I mean, we, we really became a family and not just having fun in rehearsals and fun on stage. We started to really care for each other and protect each other. Um, there are other people that are part of that group that I am still friends with to this day. So it, it, it spoke to me uh, rather resoundingly. And when ACC had ended, I thought, what could make this better? What, what could really, because I love this. Uh, and my grades started to increase rapidly. And I thought, well, make money. And the only way really I thought to make money was to go to a legitimate uh, acting conservatory and decided to go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. and just loved it there. I mean, I must say, and in, in, to my defense, I did have a 4.0 when I went there. Um, and it was, again, developing uh, this tight-knit family. Uh, we had um, uh, Annabella Ciora was part of our class, uh, Stuart Zully, um, Jerry, um, I can't think of Jerry's last name right now. But once again, these, these are friendships that are developed at such a a young vernal age and, and sustain a lifetime. Uh, so it, it, it appealed on many levels and then making money made it, made it, you know, somewhat tolerable as well. And did you have a preference for stage or TV or film or was it just acting in general? Stage, 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 stage. stage. I wanted to do nothing but stage after getting done with the Academy. I then went over to the actor's studio you know, which is a, an infamous, uh, what, theater, group theater, enclave. Uh, we're talking, you know, I was, I was studying with um, Ely Kazan and uh, in class was Al Pacino and, and uh, um, Robert De Niro, um, the woman who played the nurse in uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I can't think of her, her name right now. Um, and really, not only so much the, the thrill of being on stage and when you got it right and the audience's reaction and, and how that just that visceral swell of feeling, um, but also um, the knowledge that you gain from doing each play and studying the character, studying the writer, studying uh, you know, when the, the piece that you were doing, when it, when it was written, when it was supposed to be taking part in, and it was all just very enriching. And, and what I wanted to do and only wanted to do was theater. And um, after getting out of the academy and then going to become a member at the Actors Studio, that was my plan. My goal was to do nothing but theater, uh, but maybe do one movie a year just to be able to have enough money you know, to live in New York City. You could be on Broadway as a lead in the show and you still weren't making enough money to support yourself or have a decent apartment in New York City. Uh, so I thought, you know, do theater and, and get 
one movie a year and then I'd be set up. But unfortunately, that was a little bit sidetracked after I was run over by a truck and couldn't get arrested in New York after the accident. People wouldn't hire me because they thought I was damaged goods. So mm-hmm. I unfortunately went to or fortunately went to Los Angeles where after you know auditioning for 10 months, got an audition for this show, Family Ties, which I really didn't know. Um, I, I was, you know, somewhat of a, a theater snob. We weren't actors. We were, we were tragedians. We were thespians, right, Ellen Sue? And um, we thought, I don't mean to sound pompous, but we thought we were better than other folks. We had a higher calling. And uh, got on this sitcom. It was supposed to be a one-shot deal. And I was kind of like the date that wouldn't leave. Four years later, I'm still there collecting a paycheck and uh, sucking off the craft service table. <laughs> hey, well, 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 why don't we, uh, if Tom, can you uh, fire up that uh, clip that we have from uh, Family Ties? You're, you're muted, Tom. There we go. You surprised me. Unmute myself. There we go. <laughs> um, sure. Um, so hang on a second and let me play that for you. Where's this heaven? Hey. <laughs> I guess not. Mallory, I love you, and you love me. I can't believe that you propose to me. Marry me, marry me, Mallory. <laughs> Do you know this one? If you marry my sister, my father's going to kill you. Tom. There we go. <laughs> those, those are great. Those are great, Scott. Oh boy, that's just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so Scott, it, and um, in doing knit, well, first I, that little thing you told us, or we talked about uh, when we started. You said that you you made up that little ditty, that little Mallory song. Yeah, and I never got a royalty for it. I got to talk to somebody in ASCAP. I don't know what's going on there, brother. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's amazing how much leeway did they give you with the character uh you know it was hard to ascertain at the time i think uh alan uger actually created the idea of nick mm-hmm. um gary goldberg the executive producer was a, a very kind gracious encouraging nurturing person um i used to joke with him after seeing him after family ties and say you know you really you really screwed with me. You you made me think that Hollywood was nice people, and it was still like doing theater back at uh, with the hue and curtain players, uh, and, and a very they were very. I never there was an idea as whether it was wardrobe or, or or hair or certain moves or certain um, uh, speech patterns, you know, rhythms, um, which I did try to give Nick a certain um, his own what would we call it iambic pentameter of Nickism. Um, and they were always just very encouraging and very enriching. So um, it, w- it was rather a very comfortable, vernal environment to work in. Uh, and even from the beginning, when I got there, uh, I'll never forget coming through, you know, the sound stage, uh, the huge doors, you know, those huge doors where they bring all the equipment through and the support stage and then coming through the big fire door and seeing way off in the distance this table that had this hubbub of people around it. And I was i was late, I'm, I'm perpetually late. I'm still working on trying to be on time. 
and everybody, you know, they're having their coffee or their cereal or their bagel and coming up feeling a little bit awkward, sort of like, um, you know, like the illegitimate child um, mm -hmm. in everybody from Michael Fox to Meredith to Michael Gross, um, Tina, uh, Justine, every, the writers, Michael Whitehorn, um, I can't remember all the, the names. They were all very, very gracious, very uh, accommodating and, and very nurturing. And I was a little intimidated by the fact that I never thought of myself as a comedic actor. Uh, you know, going once again, actor studio and you're, you're trying to be method actor and this realism and this grit. And Michael Fox, who I think is, is one of the quintessential comedic actors and his timing is just impeccable was very um, encouraging, very sharing knowledge and sharing ideas in a way that wasn't belittling or demeaning. Um, so I, I was very lucky. I fell into a very, very, very uh, positive situation. So in, in um, I watched you on that, the, the podcast with uh, Big Skinny and you talked about the production and that, that really blew my mind when you started talking about how they set up, but they shot Family Ties with four cameras. Four cameras, which was great. I mean, we loved it. I mean, it, Monday we'd come in and typically by the time I got there was a the fourth season. They had they had their own rhythm. And Monday, literally, we would come in, read the script, go home. And then that night you'd get rewrites, go back in Tuesday morning, read the script at a table read, get up, rehearse it on its feet, um, go home. Wednesday you'd come in with, uh, again, you'd get rewrites Tuesday night, come in, have a table read Wednesday morning, rehearse everything out of sequence Wednesday day. And then Wednesday night you had your run through. Um, and again, they would, you know, Wednesday night, you got rewrites maybe at 11 o'clock midnight, 1 a.m. that you had to know for the next day. You know, there was no running around with a piece of paper in your hand. And then Thursday we would camera block. And it was, it was a whole, I had only done a couple of things film wise, and that was uh, 35 millimeter in New York. And still getting used to the, the difference of, of the mediums and the techniques. Because, you know, stage is very big. And depending upon the, the, the house you're in, whether it's 100 people or 1,000 people, you have to adjust to that, the number of the folks in the house and how big the house is. Um, for camera, I think, in a way, is, is somewhat liberating because you can still have that, that grandeur, maybe, maybe true scenery, um, but it's not as acute and as tight as an 85 or 100 millimeter lens. We, you really have to pull it back in. Um, and just also having, it's so fortunate to have a live audience there. When you did it on Friday night in front of a live audience and to get that immediate reaction from the audience was so thrilling. I mean, when you hit a joke at the right time and the audience mm -hmm. laughed right on cue, and I'm sure the writers, I could hear Gary laughing. You'd always hear him, you know, when the shows were taped and would play on TV. He, he loved his own show as much as anybody did. Um, but it was just such a great feeling. And I'm sure every actor that's, that's uh, here present currently and that sees this after, whether it's a moment where you want the audience to cry on cue or you want them to do that, <gasps> or, you, or you want that laugh, when, when you hit that as an actor, not only is the actor going, yeah, we did it, the director has that feeling, the writer has that feeling, and it all comes together. The great thing about doing it as theater, there's no, there are some tricks that can be done with lighting and, and you know, and shifts of sets and things like that, but it's pretty pure. What you do is what the audience gets. Um, I'd say the closest thing to that is a four camera sitcom because of, of being live. And there's only so much that they can do to play around with to correct things or to adjust your performance. Whereas if in film, you know, you shoot a scene, maybe you see dailies. Yeah, I mean, now with technology now, technology now, you see, you might as well call them secondies because you can see it right there in Video Village, what you did is immediately available and it's great. You can adjust your performance on the spot, but learning to be able to, as an actor and being an, an egotistical, narcissistic, uh, subjective little putz like I am, uh, it, it took uh, one act, one director, I can remember him grabbing me and pulling me into the screen room going, you must learn how to watch dailies. You must learn how to watch your performance and you adjust from it. You don't <laughs> judge it, it's not final, but you look, you see what you do, you make adjustments. Um, and so, 
you know, the, the trickery that can happen cinematically is beautiful and wonderful, but in the wrong hands with the wrong editor or a, 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 a vindictive producer, uh, they can take you from being a daisy to turning you into a, a dandelion. Um, so there, there's something about the purity of, of four cameras that uh, at times was, was missing with 35 millimeter. And now with digital, I mean, look at, look at the magic. You've got enough techno wizards here within your group that know how much I, I can sit here and you guys can go back and change what I'm saying and, and completely new verbiage, but my mouth will move in sync with the new words that you lay in there and you created a whole new scene. So, I, which is pretty amazing too, the stuff that was shown about the product integration. We saw that initially in, in speaking that way. I, I've got to agree. I'm jumping ahead here. I apologize. I That's fine. Right. Well, please do. Um, but the gentleman, the independent producer that spoke, and Jane, I agree with them both. I, I, I don't want to be watching True Grit and all of a sudden on the side of the mountain see a, an advertisement for, uh, you know, stay here at the Econo Lodge. Um, but for an independent producer, you know, putting together a film it's it's a a quilt of different uh, financing sources or financial guarantees and one of those guarantees you can use is product integration um and if you've got a big boy company like pepsi or fedex or anything a, a blue chip company that's giving a guarantee and they say okay you present our product in this manner and we've done it in the past where you you give them two you know you give them two shots you're going to get this or you're going to get this you pick one or the other cuz you need you know, the subjectivity out of it. You say, we're going to have this many seconds and we're going to say this and it's going to be featured like this and you're going to pay us 10 bucks if we do that. Um, and that's hard to get prior to production. You've got to be a known entity. Um, but as the gentleman, and I can't think of his name, I, Jeffrey uh, Lehman, I think was the producer that had said it. <clears throat> if you need a little money at the end, you can actually show the product. Here's, here is our show. Here's what it looks like. Here's the tone and tenor. And we can put your, on that billboard, instead of it saying T-Mobile, it can now say Fred's uh, Craft Breweries or something like that. So I, I think that's a, a, a nice tool that can help independent producers. You know, I, I like that. Did you find in, in, uh, in moving from being in front of the camera and then, then become, then starting to produce. And I noticed you, you did, did some directing as well. What were the things that you brought from your experience in front of the camera that you uh, took behind the camera? Hopefully helping actors bring a, a, a better level of, of what was real for them that made it real for the audience. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as you were kind enough to say, I've been in over 70 productions. <clears throat> and of those, maybe 10% of the directors actually knew how to direct the director. Mm -hmm. I had better directors in New York doing theater that knew how to get to the, the root of what the objective or what the driver was for the character, what the relationship was with that character, with the other, the other people in the scene, what their relationship was to the room, what the relationship was to the time, where they were coming from, where they were going. A lot of directors in Hollywood are traffic cops. And they're just saying, yeah, put the camera here and then over there. And uh, a lot of directors in Hollywood, when I was doing it, and when there was, you know, remember there were seven studios and there was maybe 11 channels. And then we went from 11 channels to the initial proliferation of cable. And there was a lot of directors that were just happy to get the job. So they were gonna do what the producer told them or the studio or the network. You're going to get the shot of the hero of the kit car da, 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 and that's what we got and you got to make your day here's your shot sheet you better get these shots in and get it done so they really didn't have time to work with the actor it wasn't like i was working with marty scorsese you know or um i don't know i think of other great directors that really were able to work on character with with the actor um so as a director and as a producer we want to afford the artist that 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 breath, that moment, that if they're able to bring that realism or bring that that little moment of, of brilliance of that they discover, you know, there's oh my God, we've discovered a new moment that the writer didn't even think about, that that moment will translate through the film and through through the monitor or the screen to the audience. And um, 
that's something that we still try to do. I, I, as you had noted in your, your questions to me, I got, I got very fed up with Hollywood. I got fed up with the lies and the bullshit. And my, my truly walking away from it was my last production deal at that time was at Madonna's company. And I went there with two films that I had name talent attached to. And there was a guarantee we're going to fund this. We're going to distribute it. And I got bupkis. And not only did I get bupkis, and not only did I look like an idiot to the very good name talent, um, I had to feed my kids. I had to put you know meals on the table, pay my, pay my mortgage. Um, and I said, screw it. And at the time, knew a gentleman out of fund that when I had a deal at MGM, I had met him. He was at a big fund out of New York and came in and pitched MGM on funding a bunch of films that never went that far, but we maintained a good relationship. And I met the woman who was now my business partner in Excelsior Capital, um, having two master's degrees, one in engineering, one in finance. And I knew the guy from the finance company. They had just financed the first turkey manure to power plant up in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And I knew my partner, Dakota, that she had done built from the ground up and sold four renewable energy plants. And I said, screw it, what are you doing? I, I, I literally was sitting in my office at Madonna's company and my office was one of those that my wall out to where all the assistants were and everything was glass. Yeah. And I'm seeing the executives from, from Maverick Entertainment come back from lunch, knowing that they went and got drunk, that they went and got stoned, that the guy who was a head guy was, was, was doing such and such in his office and not doing work. And I'm thinking, you're a fool sitting here. Why, why are you here tolerating this? And this is how you expect to feed your family? I said, screw it, handed my letter of goodbye, resignation, see you later. Um, called Kevin Beggs over at Lionsgate, who uh, first TV show I ever produced was with him at Lionsgate. And now Kevin, Kevin went from being a PA on uh, Baywatch <laughs> mm -hmm. to running a multi-billion dollar entity at one of the largest entertainment corporations in the world. And he's just a sweetheart of a guy. He's just down to earth, great guy, hard worker. And called him, I said, Begsy, <laughs> you got an office I can rent? Well, my friend, my friend, as luck would have it, you can have my office. And I thought he was kidding. And Lionsgate had moved out of their offices in Marina del Rey and moved to Santa Monica. And that's then when we started Merit Capital. Um, Merit really didn't do that well. A couple of years later, we reformulated and formed Excelsior Capital and got very lucky to be in the renewable and sustainable energy sector. And, and a lot of people said, how can you transition from the entertainment industry to that? I mean, to go from an actor to producer <laughs> to, and part of it was seeing my father, who I know Ellen and Robin had met, he passed 21 years ago. And he was a top boss on a construction firm, uh, largest privately owned construction road construction firm in the United States at the time. And seeing how he executed on jobs and how he led people and got things done, followed a budget, followed a plan. And I thought, well, okay, that's what you do producing, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when I started producing independently and every independent producer will tell you, you don't go and you don't get one, in, in a dream scenario, you have one investor that goes, here's a check, go make your movie and I'll see you later. It very rarely happens. You've got to go and you've got to get a, some guarantees out of foreign distribution. Maybe you get a guarantee in domestic distribution. You get some tax incentives. You get a little bit of equity. Maybe you mix in some product integration guarantees and you, you knit all those together. And then you get one financing vehicle that uses that as collateral and gives you a loan to go down the road and make your film. Um, and doing project finance is very much the same way. When we did ethanol, when we did biodiesel, we had to make sure we secured the, the feedstock, whether it was manure or uh, distiller grains or soybeans. We had to make sure that we secured proven known technology, that we secured a construction firm that could build it on time, on budget, and guarantee that if you put this in, it was going to make that. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't do it, that there was a contract that they hurt financially to make sure to correct it. Just sort of like on a film, you have a bond. You know, if you don't finish it, you've got, you can call the bond to make sure the director screwed up or the producer screwed up and we can finish the film and pay the investors back. So, and then back, you know, ethanol biodiesel was making sure you had an offtake contract that when you made, whether it was an ounce of fuel or 10 million gallons of fuel, somebody was going to buy it. 
I bet you got less on the back end because you were saying they were they were going, okay, we're taking a risk on you. But we became very friendly with big boy uh, fuel companies in the United States. And I got to tell you, it helped me and Nick on family ties. Okay. I can't tell you how many meetings I went to, whether it was New York or Oklahoma or Chicago. And I wouldn't play it as like, you know, hi, I'm, I'm the guy that was on a sitcom in the 80s. Remember me on Tiger Beat? But it was eventually it would come out and people would be, oh, Nick, I love that guy. I love. And, and it was a, it was a, a, an asset that I traded to get bankers, uh, hedge fund managers, equity fund managers on my side so they would believe us, so they would listen to us. And so still we had to deliver the goods. So, you know, doing financing of, of a, whether it's a, a biodiesel ethanol facility, whether it's a transmission of electricity, whether it's making food products and selling them, it's just the same as making a movie. It's all the same sound business practices. And all of it has to be built on, on quality, on truth, and on value, you know? And you can never, you just, you can't misrepresent to anybody along the chain because at some point something's going to come off the tracks and something's going to screw up and that's going to be held against you. And as long as you're honorable and honest with folks and go, yep, screwed up, take responsibility. We'll clean it up. They'll deal with you again. So I, I, I covered a lot there. I'm sorry. I jumped around. No, it's there. okay. Yeah. No, that's great. No, that's, that's a lot. That's really great to, to understand the, the, the segue from being in front of the camera to, you know, and, and getting into the, the different world of investment banking. And now you're taking that to a, a different, a different venue with your. I, uh, I wanted nothing to do with Hollywood, Jeff, nothing. I was done. Pum, 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 had an acrimonious divorce, raised my four boys, give them love. Let me continue just playing, literally making fuel out of, out of manure. Mm -hmm. um, and then met Larry Maestrich and uh, some of the folks of, of your, your group here, your committee and some of your other listeners would know, Larry's first big film was uh, Sling Blade mm -hmm. that he made by juggling credit cards for about 800, 900 grand yeah. and then sold it to Harvey Weinstein. Um, I won't get political, Jane. I know you said no politics, so I'll, I'll leave my, my, my comments with regard to Mr. Weinstein out of the program. Um, but I will say Larry's the one guy I know that actually knocked Harvey out, punched him in the jug. Boom. <laughs> so I'm very happy for that. But I, I had met Larry six years ago um, through another company we were doing work for in Tennessee and then introduced to a guy in DC, a guy in New York and the guy in New York needed help. And he said, well, I got a guy, my partner I'm working with. And that guy was a lion sack of manure. He wasn't Larry's partner, but I met Larry. And Larry, like me, was divorced, raising his kids. I was divorced, raising my kids. And that was the first thing that attracted us to each other. But for a year and a half, maybe two years, we sniffed each other like a couple of dogs in the yard. Um, I, I had had a lot of money stolen from me by a business manager. Larry had a lot of money stolen from him by business partners. And we were very untrusting and, and very skeptical as to who we'd get in business with. So it, it took us about two years before we would actually, I think, trusted each other. And then we grew tighter. I saw his, his ethics. He's very smart. He very much loves creative people. He loves independent film world. He loves independent filmmakers. Um, and and, and his, his business ethics were and are exemplary. Um, so he's a guy, you know, he's, he's either produced and or distributed over 140 films. Two of those have been nominated for Academy Awards uh, many of them have won other awards like Independent Spirit, other film festivals, and Larry rivals the independent filmmaker. You know, for a for a a Jewish kid that grew up with a in a single parent family in the Bronx and got uh, dished a lot of a lot of a lot of unsavory things growing up, and then going to Johns Hopkins and being one of the the only few. I don't know. We can we can still count on one hand how many. Jewish guys make it to the pro baseball league and him making it to the pros for a year. Um, he, he's quite an exemplary, uh, honorable, intelligent, loving, funny guy. Somebody's got dogs. You see this mark on my, wait, you see that right there? One of his dogs got the living but Jesus out of my arm. He loves dogs. Um, and um, 
Larry, at the time, we're going back, say now about uh, three years ago or so, the, the folks who were his partners at the time, it wasn't working out right. And he and I got closer and closer. Uh, he saw the business practices that I had acquired by working in the investment banking firm. And, and a lot of it was always, I always wanted to sit with the smartest person in the room. Uh, I never thought of myself as that intelligent. And I thought myself, I, I always, I love people. I love being around people. I love learning. And I thought, find out who the smartest guy or gal is in the room and align yourself with them and follow their lead. And, and, and Larry's very intelligent in the film world. Very, very intelligent. He, uh, at the time, had and still has, which is something you guys touched on earlier. Um, and, and we now enjoy it, Red Coral. We're in partnership with AMC theaters. But what does that mean now? I mean, I disagree with the guy that was quoted on the show earlier saying, well, there'll never be exhibition. Yes, there will. There will always be exhibition. That was like when movies started and, and people said, well, people will never go to the theater again. Baloney. You know, when the DVD, when VHS came out and then DVD, well, they'll never go to the movies. Yes, they will. People love the communal atmosphere, the communal effect of sitting in a dark room, watching a screen and being told a story. There's something about that that is, that is spiritual, that's almost religious, that, that, that's moving. So that'll never go away. It's going to change dramatically because of streaming. It changed dramatically because of COVID, um, but it will always be there. What, what it will mean for us as a business and as a component of our financial structuring has shifted dramatically and we'll have to, we'll have to go with the flow, baby, Make, you know, go where the shift goes. Um, so part of that and segueing into the OTT, um, Larry had told me how, you know, with streaming, with Netflix at the time, that less and less folks are going to the theaters, the numbers were going down and down. And how do we change this? And I said, let's go to TV. I don't know if you guys are aware of this and everybody here that 25% of Americans still get their TV from rabbit ears. From rock. Uh, really? Amazing. 25% of our, now that may have gone down a little bit in the past couple of years, but the analysis we've done and the research that we've had done for us is 25%. Because there's a lot of folks, they don't get cable. They can't afford a dish. They don't have internet in their house. There's still a lot of this country that needs to be wired. So, um, I said, we should do TV. We should do first run on TV, live in syndication, and then let's form an OTT. Uh, we were hired by a company. Our company was hired by a company years ago to advise. They wanted to launch an OTT with a very specific programming mindset. And I said, look, number one, you're going to charge folks. And the only people at that time that were charging folks was MLB and uh the, the, the right wing guy that left uh, like Fox News and formed his own, uh, the Blaze, whatever that guy's name is. Yeah. And he said, they're the only ones that are doing it and doing it right and are able to charge people. You should offer it for free, have advertising, but initially put it on broadcast, put it in syndication, um, sell it internationally, and then let it live forever on your OTT. Of course, they listened to zero of what we advised them on, and they lost about $20 million. They also, at the time, spent about $5 million to build their OTT. And as we all know, technology uh, here in this, our time together, we've been talking cameras. And technology of cameras changed not year to year, month to month. A whole new rabbit's coming out, a whole new machine. And, and be careful with your investment because there's going to be a better one that's going to be cheaper that's going to come out next month. So we were trying to advise them to not put $5 million into the OTT and buying the technology, rent the technology for somebody else and let a lot of the kinks get worked out. Well, when Larry wanted to do that, he said, let's, let's do content that we will, it will live in broadcast initially, go to cable, go to syndication, and we can put it on our OTT and we can run the living bejesus out of it. And that has, that was from two and a half years ago we have paid, we're now on our third set of coders <laughs> that we hope we have the right guys now. We think we have the right guys now. They're a bunch of uh, brainiacs from uh, Johns Hopkins, um, guys that wanted to be hired by uh, Elon Musk. And we'd said to them, you know, what's going to happen to you? What happened to the guy? I don't know if anybody out there remembers the guy that inv invented the magic wand that we all turn our blinker on with, on our steering car. Yeah. And it also, Flash of Genius was that movie. 
Yes. 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 And you also can do your wipers on it. You can do your uh, your your cruise control. You could do you know your directional. And he got a gold watch when he retired, and, and the same salary he had gotten for forty years from Ford. We said, you know, you go work for Elon Musk or you go work for Jeff Bezos. They're going to do the same thing for you. Here's your check. I own the idea. I own all the rights. Um, and that's kind of what led to us in forming our OTT. And I know you, you had said, why? why? Why Red Coral Universe? We love independent films. I still have, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 friends that are independent filmmakers whether they're shooters or writers or directors or actors. And the, with, the, with the advent of, of digital equipment, you know, remember with 35 millimeter, when I started out, you had a great day if you got 26 setups in. It was a phenomenal day. One camera, 26 setups, whoa! Now with digital, you can get 75 setups in a day because your, your lighting equipment is maybe two lights. You don't need a lot of flags. You don't need a lot of C-stands. You don't need a lot of cable. You, your cameras may be this big instead of this, this huge thing that looked like a VW bug. Um, when, when you run out of film, you, you change a chip. You don't go, check the gate, bring in another bag. Okay, everybody smoke a cigarette and get discombobulated. <clears throat> you can maintain that continuity. You can maintain that vibe and, and you can flow. And the great thing is even more so, Filmmakers now, they can put Disney out of business. They can put Apple out of business. They can put Amazon, Warner Brothers, Universal, Paramount, Sony, all of them, because they don't need them. They go make their own film, and you can make a great film. I've done it for $200,000. You can make a great film for $50,000. I produced a movie that Steven Fearberg, I don't know if you know who he is, one of the best cinematographers around. He saved the film, and it was done digitally. And we paid actors good money and the film turned out phenomenally. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the distribution system at the time isn't what it is now, but you can go and make your own gosh darn great film for 50 to 100 grand, and you can distribute it yourself. So we, we want to, part of Red Coral Universe is to rival the independent filmmakers, the independent content makers. Um, every day there's a new streaming service coming up. There was one I got an announcement yesterday. There's a new streaming service. And what is it? It's going to be TV shows from the 70s and the 80s. Okay, I'm going to get another $7 residual check from Family Ties. Woo-hoo! Um, and they're regurgitating the same shit over and over and over and over. And if you're an independent filmmaker, you went from independent film houses are now, they're shut down more and more. Pre-COVID, they were closing more and more. And as an independent filmmaker, you knew if I, if I got the right advertising and I got the right press, I can maybe earn my money back in Chicago, Atlanta, um, Milwaukee, where I hit the right notes and I can make my million, million and a half back. Well, that same film now you can make for 150, 200, 250,000 and you can distribute it yourself via the internet. But now what happens, a lot of independent filmmakers when Netflix came out and nothing against Netflix, although do they, they do make a lot of crap make a lot of bad, bad, bad stuff. And they throw a lot of money at it. And they think because we're going to throw money at it, it's going to be great. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. got shit, sure. that looks pretty. Yeah. You know, George Clooney, great guy, did great, got lucky on his tequila company with the guy who's his partner. That film that came out that they used the wall, and we're, we're looking to actually finance one of those walls, a digital wall. What was that mm -hmm. film where they went to Mars or whatever? Looked beautiful. Cinematography was exquisite. The sets were beautiful. What was the story? What happened? And people used to complain about Chris Albrecht, who actually made HBO, who actually got Sopranos, who got the other cool shows. HBO, no matter how quixotic Chris was in running his camp, and no matter how much debauchery he had, he had great shows. He knew great talent, and it looked great. Unfortunately, Amazon's got a lot of money. Apple's got a lot of money. Netflix has a lot of money. And just because you got money doesn't mean you got taste. Mm -hmm. And you still got to, you got to find that great idea. People still, okay, we can go and we can watch how many bing, bang, boom, bahs. We can watch how many guys and gals in spandex suits. But if there isn't a story, we're not engaged. If we don't care about the people that we're watching, or if we don't care about what's happening, we're not going to watch it. We're not going to be engaged. We don't have a visceral connection. It's funny, one of my sons, who's now 33, very proud, has a master's degree in health, great kid, 
um, works his ass off, love him dearly. When the movie Twister came out, remember Twister with Helen Hunt? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Tom Paxson, yeah. Yeah, Bill Paxson, great guy. Yeah. yeah. And it was what? Hurricane, Twister, yeah. after yeah. Twister, after yeah. Twister. And my son at the time, Shaler, who was maybe 11, 12, he turned to me about halfway through the movie and he said, Dad, Dad, is this it? Is this what? Is this it? Is, is this it? What? What? What is what? What are you talking about? What is what? Is this the movie? I said, yeah, bud, we're in the movie. We got our popcorn. We got our juju beans. We got our soda. We're in the movie. He said, but all it is is a bunch of hurricanes. There's no yeah. story. Yeah. So if my 11 or 12 year old son can realize it, <laughs> these big companies with billions of dollars, and I hate Amazon for killing the, the little guy in the little store. They had the friggin' audacity where I lived in LA before I moved back to New York in the Palisades. How many bookstores did Amazon kill? How many mom and pop bookstores? How many chains where you could go and hold the book and look at it, feel it, read it, smell the ink, smell the paper, gone. What do they put in the new mall that they put into the Palisade? A bookstore! <laughs> anyway, I'm getting a little passionate here. <laughs> what we want to be is we don't want a canned idea. We don't want the idea to live or die because you got cool effects or you got people in spandex or because some chick showed her tits or some guy showing his dick. We want a story. We want people to feel about it. If you look at Larry's career and what he's done and the movies that have risen, they're about the human element. The things that I felt that I did best at, that the performances I'm most proud of are stories that were about the human element and that we want to connect with people. So we want to be a home for independent filmmakers, independent content makers. We want to have little shows. If it's a show that's, if it's three minutes long, that's okay. If it's a story that's compelling, there's stuff that we are seeing from young filmmakers that are 16, 17 years old. That is just phenomenal that these people, the stories that they're telling, the heartfelt, it's almost like therapy in a way, uh, how touching it is. And um, it's just, it's very exciting. You look at Netflix and for a period of time, a lot of independent filmmakers thought, oh, my saving grace, they bought my film. I made my money back, I can pay my investors back, I can pay the bank back, and I can go make another one. And really, yes, that's what it's about. You wanna pay the bank back, you wanna pay the investors back, so you can do it again. So when you see those people, you don't have to hang your head and go, oh yeah, I lost your money, but it was a great story. We had fun at the rap party, didn't we? You wanna, you wanna be able to do, beyond tell a story, you gotta make the money back. So you sold your film to Netflix and it disappeared. I don't know how many people on this portal here have, have a Netflix account, but everybody, each of you that have an account, Netflix shows you because of their algorithm, the same 400, 500 selections. And they own 25 to 30,000 selections, but they're only showing you 400 to 500, unless you know the codes to put in. And there are other films that people bled over, that people sweat over, that people gave their heart to, that are great stories that go, I made my money back, I sold it to Netflix, but nobody ever sees it. And why are we here? We're here to tell stories. That's what we want. Instead of sitting around the fire 200, 300, 80 years ago, we're sitting around this, this fire and we want to share the human element, the story. So that's what we want Red Coral to be. We want to share, share the story, share the human element, have a place where independent filmmakers can come and feel safe and tell their story. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Are well, we done? I, I need I, water. You need water. Yeah. That, I, I loved what you said on the, the big skinny interview about letting the, letting the film be the star, not the network. Yes. Yeah. That's our goal. You know, look at all, you know, we're all going to go watch content at some time today. And it's like, watch Disney plus watch discovery, watch uh, Paramount, blah, 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 blah. Watch NBC. Blah, blah, blah. You aren't going to see watch red coral. You're going to see a show. And you're going to be compelled, hopefully, by the show. Where do I find that? Oh, down here in the corner, I'll say, go to Red Coral Universe. We want the show to be the star. We want the storytellers to be the star. So we have, we have, and I know you, you look for content makers, and we have, you know, on this, in this program and this, this organization, we have a lot of independent filmmakers and a lot of content makers. How would they... A, what are they, what are you looking for from them? What is... Well, let me, let me, let me say, we have our own money. Okay. 
we have a fund that has been kind enough to give us a certain amount of dollars to make content from. So we will, we will load our OTT with content. Mm -hmm. It's a good amount of money, but we want to be smart with it. So what we have to do is we have to make sure we can fund a hundred percent of the endeavor, but we want 75% of it collateralized somehow, some way. Mm -hmm. All right. Whether it's a foreign sale, a domestic, a product integration, subordinate equity, something like that. We have to, because that's our agreement with the big fund that we get our money from. And the things that have, you know, there's, there's filmmakers that are coming that they've got talent attached. They have some distribution attached. Um, they've got where they're going to shoot. So they've secured their tax incentive or they've really locked into it and have dealt with the film commission from that state, that territory, that country to know that they're going to get that amount of money and, and do that little bit of homework. Produce your film somewhat. That's producing. It isn't sitting in a chair and, you know, having your name on the back of the, the chair. Produce it. Actually produce it. Don't grab a script and go, well, I got a great script because everybody's got words on a piece of paper. So I, we want them a little, a little bit produced, a little bit of investment into it, a little bit, some assets brought to it. And, and we will, we will help get it to the finish line. Um, and it doesn't matter. We are very, uh, you know, story content agnostic. Uh, as long as it fits our financing formula, we will help you get it done. Uh, we're going to be doing, we've got a deal up in Canada. We're going to do a bunch of projects up there. You got a deal in New York. We're going to do, there's a better tax incentive. If you go further North, further away from the city, we're going to do some stuff there. Um, we're looking to make a deal on, I don't know if you know these walls, they use it in that film. I don't know what George Clooney did for, Netflix. What was it called? Mars or? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I don't know. Mindless meanderings, whatever it was. A lot of that was shot on these digital walls that are 280 degrees, I think, or, or, or you know, it's not a complete circle, but you can create, it's like a, right. a, a green screen on steroids. Yeah, we've talked about it on the, at this program, actually. <laughs> so we're looking to make a deal with a company that has a, a proprietary license for that put it into a studio where you know we can offset some of our financial risk by leasing it out to other production entities but then also using it if we want to do a film on mars we don't have to go to mars we can recreate it with this wall um and we just you know look we want to work with good people there's a guy we're working with now a young producer sashi alon uh, we just financed part of his movie that he did with christina ricci they say young guys, 35, you know, you, you and I, we got a lot of gray hair and I see a couple <laughs> other gray hairs out here <laughs> as well. But this guy at 35, he's got his shit together, man. He's we're at the point of delivering the film. He knows how to do QC. He knows how to get his NOAs done. He knows all of his deliverables. And it's a guy that he, excuse my blue collar vernacular, I, 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 but he, he pisses ice cubes. He's very calm when, you know, with any production people, when, and this tells you too, there's always going to be something that goes wrong and it's probably going to happen on a daily basis. And sometimes it may happen five times in a day. And it's not a matter of if it's going to happen because it will happen. It's a matter of how you deal with it when the proverbial feces hits the fan. And we want to work with guys like Sasha that are just, that are chill, that are very calm. And then if they tell you the sky's blue, you don't have to get up and go look out the window to make sure the sky's blue. So, you know, all comers. Um, and and if, they, if you want to put something up where you funnel the projects through your group here, and what, what is it, SD? SD Media Pros. SD Media Pros, even. Look, we could talk about doing something uh, like co-pros with SD Media Pros. We could do in conjunction but we have a financial formula that we have to match because the big fund that gave us use of the money, we told them, okay, we'll do this. You give us that. So we have to be, we have to honor our agreement. Sure. Understand. That's great. That's, and it's, it's so exciting that, you know, it's the independent con the content that, that is going to get the, gets to be featured, not just, uh, not just the, the big studios and all that. Um, and one thing I want to touch on, and then what we'll, we'll, I see some questions piling up here, and I'm sure people have in the in our audience have some questions, but um, I do want to touch on your podcast. You sent me those links, and I made a slide to, to put the the links up, and I'll put it in the chat as well. But what can you tell us about why I should listen to them? 
we, Larry and I, you know, podcasts are becoming more and more sort of like the magazine or the newspaper of today in a way. And people want to speak their mind. And, and there's some folks are getting a lot of dollars thrown at them to share their opinion. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times that opinion is routed in, in meanness and, in, in, uh, who can top who, who can be more belligerent, who can be more, uh, you know, calling somebody out, just being a jerk. We wanted something that was inspiring, something that, um, that could lift people up. And part of it is turning to artists and not just actors, not just writers, not directors, but painters, dancers, choreographers, uh, flautists, uh, composers, uh, poets. When the shit hits the fan and things get scary in the real world, as they've gotten real scary this past year with COVID, I've had five friends die, die. And I got to put part of that on. I can't talk politics. Jane said no politics. I'll stay away from it. Um, but when 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 the shit gets real, people turn to art. Art is sort of the glue that holds society and culture together. And those are the people that we turn to for comfort. So we want to talk to those people and hear how what inspires them. How do they inspire their audience, their listener, their reader, their watcher? Um, and that's what the the genesis of the show was. And we're getting some really cool folks that that have a love of the art, that the art speaks to them. Yeah, I, I listen listen to, to some of them. It's really good, really interesting. Great, great to uh, be giving back too, to, to be teaching people, you know, to be sharing that, yeah. that knowledge. Um, I think, why don't we, um, I can see in chat, we have some questions. Um I don't know, Jane or David, if you've been uh, tracking them or um, how we'd like to do that. Jane, I saw you had a question. So why don't we uh, start with you and then we'll go from there. I love you, Ellen. I love you, Robin. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much, Scott, for being here. This is a great, great discussion. Um, I'm going to ask the question that I'm guessing many people uh, who are watching are thinking, how are you sourcing material? How are stories coming to you? How are scripts coming to you? How are finished products coming to you? And then how are you reviewing and deciding what you're you're planning to include or not include? Um, are you talking scripts or finished product or products in process or all all all? I, all I think there? I'm talking all of the above. Just knowing the the makeup of this group and filmmakers out there, you know, there's either a, a you know, obviously you'd want log line summary script screenplay Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and or something that has been you know that's well into production or has been produced so jane the um the thing that we have always found and we're lucky enough at excelsior capital not red coral where there were a couple of times again that we had funds that made money available to us because they liked how we did our business and they thought that we were good at mitigating risk And they thought we were good at returning the money and making a little bit of cream on top for the money. So they gave us the right to use the money. And as soon as you put a shingle out that says, we've got dollars, a lot of stuff just starts coming. So (laughs) it's literally been word of mouth. Um, What we've been trying to do is initially, because it's very important, this first plop of money we have, if we return it in the manner that has been agreed upon, then they make six times as much money available to us. And then if we return that again, then they make, you know, then that increases again. And and we want to keep, we want to stay at the crab's table and keep rolling the dice. Um, So the material that we've been getting is literally from friends and associates and folks that know us. Um, We just got this commitment about, I'd say the, the, the ink is still wet on the contract. Um, but it was about six, eight months ago that, that, you know, it's been talked about for about a year and doing deals of this size and having, but the largest deal we ever did at Excelsior was three ethanol plants and that was $750 million. And that took a long time to, it was like pushing boulders up the hill. And as soon as you got one here, another one was sliding, run over and get that run. So it took a long time to make everybody comfortable. And now to put out and say, okay, we have this now. We, we want to do this because we raised the money on ourselves, for ourselves, 
for the OTT that came out of essentially our own pockets and other private investors. Um, and in doing these films, it's not a prerequisite that their films have to live on our OTT. We'll give the option mm -hmm. if they want it to be there or if they want to use it as a, a last source of distribution to make sure the money's made back. Certainly that's available. Um, our relationship, our partnership with AMC, that's available. Um, but it's not a, we want to do what's best for the film or for the show. Um, but right now, materials have been coming tr mainly from friends and, and good associates. Um, I think opening it up here, and I'd love if you guys want to be a portal to funnel things through to us, we're more than happy to get things that go, you know, it's sort of you, you look at how good is it artistically and you read it and go, oh my God, this is a story that has to be told. It has to be told. Or, or this so resonates with me. I've got to share this with the world. You know, um, you know, it's like a great cookie, and you want to. Oh, this is so good. You got to have a bite. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so there's that, but there's also things that come and help fit our business model, where if something has come and they've got they've got their tax incentive in place, they've got their foreign distribution deal where they've got key territories pre-sold. And you go, wow, this, this meets our criteria of the 75-25. Now, we're the only ones in the business. There's nobody else that's doing it. We'll gap 25%. So that means 25% is open. You don't have to have that covered. No bank, no fund, nobody does it. We do it. We do it based on the assessment of what's the script, who are the people involved with it, and what's their, their distribution plan. Um, and we want to, we don't want to be Machiavellian, but we want to make sure we protect our money um, because it is how we feed ourselves. It is how we pay our bills and keep, keep a roof over our heads. But we also want to encourage talent. So, and the other thing is we're never going to compete with the studios. We can't compete with, with, with Universal. We can't compete with uh, Amazon or, or Apple. We, we don't have that kind of money. What we've had made available is, is really nice and it's a good amount of money, but it's not <clears throat> it's not Star Wars money. And we wouldn't want to do that anyway. That never really spoke to me. I got to make it get my head chopped off, but I think I've seen one Star Wars movie. <laughs> uh, tell I mean, us a little bit just as a follow up, like what sort of movies do speak to you? Like what have you been reading that are the stories that you say this has to be told? Well, looking at you and guessing, and you should never guess a woman's age, but I'm guessing you're at least 20, maybe 30 years younger than me. So when I was, when I was a tyke and, well, thank and growing, you. growing up, things that spoke to me then were movies like uh, Serpico, A Man Called Horse, Marathon Man, and then obviously, you know, uh, um, um, uh, Godfather, and then other 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 movies of the human element then then getting into funny movies to me funny were like a fish called wanda i thought was was hilarious <clears throat> and they're movies that that speak to the human element we're doing a, one of the films we're doing is called the walkers and it's basically about a family it takes place about a day and a half in a house it's very claustrophobic um and it's very revealing of, of who we are as families and how we interact with each other. I don't want to give away what it is because it's such a it's such a cool script. It's so cool. But it's a bit John Guerish, a bit uh, uh, maybe a little Sartre in there. And but it's very much the human element. So those are the things that appeal. But don't let any folks. Look, there are things that Larry say to me. He's like, "Yeah, eh, you're too artsy fartsy." You know, there's we're looking at a horror movie, uh, and as much as I've been in a gazillion horror movies, they're not my thing. They paid the bills, they put food on the table, um, and Larry's like, "Shut up!" <laughs> you know, we're also looking for. We'd like to find something that was like the next John Hughes-ish, uh, mm -hmm. something in that vein. I'd love to find a romantic comedy. They're they are so hard to do, and so many people poo poo them. But when they work and they really sing to people's hearts and, and you can watch you get a little choked up and pull your honey closer to you and, and all that. So we'd like to find that, too. We'd like to find those things. And we've got some other things that folks have sent us that are very avant-garde, just weird. 
but they're so compelling. And it's like, wow, <laughs> this is not really sure I understand it, but I'm really intrigued by it. Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that answer. And um, you're and being so specific. Jeff, I'm going to turn it back over to you so you can kind of facilitate some of the other questions. Okay, I, yeah, we I do have... go on for an hour, but we, we yeah. have some audience members with questions. I, I, I knew that some of those things would, would ring a bell with you, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I guess, Jeff Deverett, you've had a few questions. And, uh, and then I want to also, after you're done, I want to go to Ellen because she had a very interesting uh, question as well. But uh, Jeff Deverett, uh, do you want to share your questions with uh, Scott? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. So Scott, first of all, that's a really exciting and, and great initiative that you guys are doing. And the independent world needs it so badly, obviously. But, um, you know, as you said, it's a business. You got to make money. Your investors want to return. So I just have some a whole bunch of business questions, if you don't mind. Um, sure. I come from the distribution world as well. So first of all, is Red Coral, is it going to be um, like an SVOD platform or an AVOD platform? AVOD. Oh, okay. Or not, right. not even, it's gonna, yeah, it'll be an AVOD. We want to be advertise supported. We will have an option though. And I'm saying that you can come in and you can, you can do a subscriber. I'm not a fan of subscription. I think there are too many streaming services that come out now and it's like, okay, pay your five bucks and you can come watch our shows. I want people to be able to just tune and go, oh, okay, they watch it. So folks will have the option of either having advertiser supported or subscription supported. And that's being built by all the genius uh, coders that we have that will give folks that option. Okay. And how are you going to attract audience? Like the, the truth is, listen, I'm an independent filmmaker and I'm a big supporter of independent film, but you know, it's really hard to compete as an independent filmmaker against the big Hollywood stuff, especially now that all these, you know, big, everybody's in on the streaming business and offering, as you say, like, you know, older stuff over and over and over again. And that's because it generally works because most audience. It works. I mean, look, let's, let's look at Ted Turner. When Ted Turner started TNT, TBS and TNT, people, oh my God, you believe this is idiot from down south and he's, he's licensing all these old movies. Nobody's going to watch that. Who's going to watch that? And he did it. He ran them over and over and over. And he made not, not millions, not hundreds of millions. He made billions, billions, gross dollars. I don't know what his net was, but certainly a lot more than what, what you and I made combined. Right. Um, okay. So but, the question is, how are you going to get... How are you guys going to draw audience? I'm just curious. I mean, it's such a competitive environment now. We, we will I'm have the film will be the star. The TV show will be the star. Each show will have its own media campaign. Each show will have its own publicist assigned to it. And it'll be an, uh, incumbent upon that show to, to find its way through with the myriad of modalities where you can promote shows now whether it's TV or magazine or, or online magazines. Um, and with the financial, remember, not we aren't going to make a film and its only home is going to be Red Coral. It may be in the theater for a while at AMC. It, we may actually make a deal with Universal or make a deal with Lionsgate where they distribute it uh, domestically. We may even just sell off domestic and say, okay, we've covered that part of our nut but make sure that we carve out in the contract that after a certain period of time, we get to air it at our OTT since we're actually financing it. Some folks may agree with that. Some folks may not, but, but we wanted eventually to be able to live back at our OTT. Right. And also we want to, you know, we're, we're looking at budgets that are more in the independent range. We're looking at things that are typically under 10. There are some things that are over 10, a couple that are over 20 but we want to be very, not conservative, we want to be very prudent with how we spread our money around. And, and as you know, being an independent producer, um, a lot of beautiful independent films were not made for you know, 15, 10, $20 million. They were made for one, two, three million. Mm -hmm. uh, we <clears throat> have certain foreign companies that we, foreign distributors that we are making deals with where they've got good, you know, every every distributor, just like every salesman or saleswoman, they've got their go-to clients. So these foreign distributors have got, they got a guy in Italy, they got a gal in, in France, they got another guy in the UK, they got a woman in Spain, and they know they can go sell those territories and get X amount of dollars. 
And for us, it's more like the, the small ball game. We, we want bunts and singles. We don't need home runs. Eventually something will be a home run, but bunts and singles pushes them around the bases. As long as we just make the money back and we're able to roll it over again, something will be that big of a hit where people go, oh my God, we have got to see Wells meets Feinberg. That's a great film. Well, where do you watch it? Well, it's on Red Coral. What's Red Coral? And people will start to know Red Coral by that. Um, remember at one time, people didn't know what HBO was. One time people didn't know what Netflix was. And it started to make a name for itself, not because they were great portals or they were great uh, you know, channels, they had a cool show. Right, so right. There, there will be that cool show that people align themselves with. Now we did, we have a deal with the NFL, we're making some shows with them. Uh, we have another deal with the second most prominent uh, board game in the world that has sold over 120 million rule books. And that's how you, you calculate from what I've been, my research and what I've been taught, that's how you calculate the success of, of those board games like Dungeons and Dragons. They've already got a built-in audience. They already want to see it. So as long as we are true to the story, we are true to the content, and we are true to the fan, they will come to our show. Um, a lot of these chat boards that you see and a lot of other uh, social media interfacing sites, there are folks that get pissed off at how they depicted whatever, whether it was Fantastic Four or this comic or that comic, we want to remain true to its original form and have that be a success. And then, then the knowledge of our OTT will grow then from. I, I totally agree that the content drives for sure the viewership, no question. But but what, what most independent filmmakers struggle with, I mean, you know, obviously struggle to make a good piece of content, but assuming you check that box, it's creating awareness with audience around the world or in the United States. And are you going to assist filmmakers with that? Or do you expect them to do that and bring sort of the audience to the platform? Is it a partnership? How does that work? It'll be a partnership. And each, each film will have in its budget a media campaign. You know, you'll have a top notch uh, publicist that's going to promote the living bejesus out of it and do the usual dog and pony show. Um, and that lives for a certain period of time chew on that and then where can you find it? And depending on whether it's a, in a theater or if it's here or here, or it's gonna live over at, at Red Coral, um, that's so folks can find it. And just last thing, cause I, I have a million questions. I'm gonna have to connect with you later on, but I don't wanna hijack sure, the sure. platform. So um, if you, um, let's say acquire a third party product, let's say somebody's already made a movie, an independent movie and you acquire it, finished, um, does Red Coral want it? Is it just a license deal or would be an equity deal? Do you guys want to own some of that, a piece of that? Do you well, want to control it, it? We'll approach it on a project by project basis. And we would, you know, looking at the content, what type of content it is. Um, it may even be a barter deal. It could be an outright buy. It could be a, we'll act as the distributor of last resort and then take advantage of the relationships that exist within our organization already. Uh, foreign and domestically to try to get it out. There are actually libraries that we are in negotiation on where folks have made these films and they've sat. And it's amazing how folks don't know how to get their films out. Um, and a lot of that element is based on relationship. You know, these people that, that buy films and distribute films, very rarely do they ever watch the whole film. They go in for like the first 20 minutes and they fast forward to minute 60 to minute 80, and then they go from minute 90 to minute you know, 110, <clears throat> and they want to see those pieces. It's not the most perfect way of acquiring a product for rights or distribution, but it's a lot of how business done because there's such a voluminous amount of content. Mm -hmm. So if we can help somebody and help ourselves in the time, um, it's going to be dependent upon the film, maybe an outright buy, it may be a, we'll take advantage of our machine to put your product through and get it to our distribution avenues so that it just is going to be approached on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Okay, listen, I wish you the best of luck. I hope you're enormously successful because that will be bode very well for independent filmmakers. Dude, we just want to have a party, seriously. <laughs> I mean, and, and I, look, I hope it's as successful. Jeff Trober, Ellen Feinberg, Robin Wills, we've known each other for, when we graduate from college five years ago, six years ago? Yeah, five or six, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we're coming up on our uh, fifth anniversary, I think. But, but back to what I spoke of initially, there's, there's such a sense of community. You've been in the business... Not Jeff Trover, but Jeff that was just talking. Everett, about. Everett, yeah. <laughs> Everett, I'm sure there are films that you walk on the set and it's like, oh my God, there's a guy that did sound on a film like 10 years ago and I loved you and you were great, man. And there's the, somebody that did makeup and somebody. We're like abandoned tragedians. We're like vagabonds that, that are going town to town in our, our wagons. And it's just so great. We should love and support each other. I got to tell you, one of the interesting things, I moved from LA back to New York in September. Um, part to care for my 87 year old mother, who's a pain right in the friggin' butt. <laughs> she needs to go to the doctor and she won't go to the doctor. Okay. But anyway, um, here in New York, the film community seems to rival and support each other and cheer each other out in SoCal. It's so mean and spiteful. I'm like, Oh, you're making a film. Well, what's the budget? Uh, it's only 3 million. Well, my budget's 4 million. And I bet, or who do you, you know, it's like such a competitive thing instead of championing each other and supporting each other. So I, I, I find that's very refreshing back here and I love it. You, know? I, you, you would like, you would like San Diego, Scott, because that's, that's the community here is very supportive of each other as part of our organization. And at least, you know, at least at the levels we're at, I th we find a lot of people that are, uh, you know, pretty supportive of each other. And uh, yeah. Uh, and that's the way it should be, you know, yeah. It should be like the, 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 what was it? The Q and curtain players. Yeah. 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 That's uh that's, uh, I worked on a film a few years ago on the, is a documentary, a feature link documentary on the history of craft brewing in San Diego County. And the funny thing was exactly what you're saying about New York production is people, now they weren't rivals. They worked together. Oh, you're starting a brewery. We'll, we'll come help you out. We'll distribute your beer for you, you know, and that's how it built. Um, I want to see if Ellen had a question in in our uh, in our chat. I want to see if she wants to come on and ask that question, or uh, if she wants me to. Oh, ask me? It. No, I couldn't possibly. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, I, I know. <laughs> Not moi. Um, actually, one <clears throat> interesting point since Scott was the one that brought up Serpico is that in our little family group, one of the people that was part of our group, uh, her dad was actually one of Serpico's bodyguards. So I don't know if Scott does or doesn't remember, but Chris O'Kane's dad was. Yes. So yes. anyway, I just thought I'd bring That's up that right. little point because you oh were the one that God. brought up Serpico. Um, so here, this is um, about me. No, actually, it's about you. But given my love, I'm sorry, I meant your love for stage. It sounds like the construct of what you're doing is independent film. And what I would love for you to entertain if the God so will it is that there are so many regional theaters that are coming up with these, you know, playwrights that come up with these independent works and plays that are mounted. They don't necessarily find their way to Broadway, but they're important. Right. And we know, I think Broadway has its own streaming service. I used to subscribe to digital um, theater in it's London funny. because I'm a I'm a West End kind of junkie. But um, would you or are you guys going to entertain, given your love of stage that you had that passion there? God, how long could it take me to possibly ask this question? But will you entertain that in terms of being able to somehow capture new works at regional theaters? Yes. For, okay. Yes. Well, thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> it's been great. Phenomenal question. No, I, I completely forgot to mention that. We've already made a deal with um, one of the creators of Hamilton. Um, gosh, golly, I can't think of his name. He, he actually went to the Academy as well. Um, and we are calling them Pluvies. That we are going and we, were, we will be filming or digitally recording of uh, the plays and then streaming them on Red Coral. And, and also initially we're gonna try to make them available on a larger platform uh, 
whether we could sell them to NBC or HBO or Cinemax or, or whomever. So there's definitely money is already allocated for that. And deals have already been negotiated. Um, some, you know, some great plays, great playwrights. And, and that's a very vernal, rich vein that we want to mine and bring to bigger audiences. Yeah. Good question. Okay, we'll, we'll have to talk. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, okay. As long as you don't get me out in a boat, okay? <laughs> I, I, prom- I do, I do, I love boats. I yeah. promise you nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, that, that story goes along with the, what, bottle corks and Oreos and, yeah, never mind. Moving on. <laughs> Well, good thing they didn't have uh, cameras at was it Fort Salem Theater when we were singing in Russian, Scott? Remember <laughs> Fiddler? <laughs> oh, God. The stories. Yeah. The stories never, 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 never offer to your college professor to be the stage manager for a show when they need people. <laughs> 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 they tell you the day before you got to sing. <laughs> anyway. Um, I want to just, if you can hang a few more minutes, I want to see if there's any more uh, questions. Uh, I'm trying to see if uh, anyone's got any more in there. Does anyone want to pop on with a question? Crickets. Really? God. There's definitely a comment from uh, Dan. So uh, Dan said, uh, thank you. You've been one of the best speakers we've had so far. Hope to meet you in person someday. Thank you. So that comes from Dan in chat on Zoom. So thank well, you, Dan. Dan. The, that check for a hundred bo- bucks will be to him by tomorrow. Or if he'd like, I could I could sell it to him. Okay. <laughs> Dan, did you want to add anything else to that? I think he may have had to drop off, but maybe. He's yeah, still- I'm. I'm. I got to go. There but um, definitely one of the best speakers and. And a load of information that I wish a lot of these filmmakers actually knew that I that I deal with. They they just have no clue as to the business side of what we do. And no, they've got to uh, learn that they've got to you got to learn the business whether you're an actor or exactly. writer. Or, you've got to I, learn the business, or you're going to get, the choir. I, I just wish the choir was listening, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you. That was great. That was really thank good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. See you later. See you later. And we got yeah. another question from uh, Jeffrey. Um, Jeffrey, did you want to? Yeah, I, I guess for me, uh, I just wonder if uh, maybe you have a couple of, I, kn- I know every single deal is different. I mean, every deal I've ever done in TV has been different for distribution and all the rest. But, um, and, and I, I come from, you know, doing like documentary. I have a travel series that, uh, I provide free to PBS nationally and then has been distributed. I've distributed it to more than 20 foreign countries. So I kind of know how that works. Um, but like I said, each deal is different. And what I'm trying to get my hands around uh, is maybe what, what uh, if you have like a couple of standard deals, not that that's the deal that we're going to uh, get or have with you or anything like that, but um, what you're talking about for me is super vague and, and as a, uh, independent producer, I need like details like, Oh, you know, this is like one deal that we did. And we don't, I don't need specifics of a, of a film name or anything like that, but like generally yeah. like, Oh, well, we distributed it to these foreign countries and then we got the, well, you know, the, the real, no, I hear what you're saying. And you know, documentaries are, are quite different animal. Then, totally uh, different. Totally different. Totally different. But Larry, my partner, <clears throat> has done some phenomenal documentaries and, and has made money from them, which you know it's very hard to make money from documentaries. Um, but a very standard thing to look for and that, that works, um, Jeff, right? Jeff? Yes. Uh, yeah. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. <clears throat> Is if you can come with the script, the script that's almost you know, has been, has been um, not blocked, but you've got a schedule and you've got a day out of days. And the thing that really still talks, and we're talking scripted material, we're talking, you know, is the talent. And a lot of times, like me, when I started out producing, I made a mistake. Uh, I did a film once and I, 
I had Jean Renault and Sean Bean and, and you know, Julian Sands and uh, other guys, you know, just great guys. And really, I, I screwed myself because it was hard to get the money because they were all really good and people in the business knew them. But for a distributor, they want to go and they want to go, what do you got? Yeah, Mickey Mouse or Mighty Mouse? I can tell Mickey Mouse or Mighty Mouse. So go get, get that script and do whatever you've got to do. Go paint Mickey Mouse's house. Go wait outside, you know, um, I can't think of the director, the Asian guy who's directed uh, uh, Denzel Washington in a couple of films. Even after he had Denzel in a film and wanted to get him again, he flew to New York. He sat outside Denzel's house for days and waited for him to come out and go down the stairs. And he followed him to the coffee shop and sat down and said, and he was like, I, I can't remember the guy's name, the director. Uh, I'll say Antoine Fuqua, but it wasn't. It was like, and he said he knew he had to get that piece of talent that moves the needle. That's better than my money. That's better than any distribution deal. That's better than anybody's money because the money will follow that. So what you can get depending upon your budget, if you're making the film for a million, your, 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 your field of your depth, your scope is this much, you know, you're making the film for a hundred million. You got like three or four guys or gals that can open that movie. Try to keep your budget low, not to be cheap, because you're setting it up for yourself that you can pick Mickey Mouse, Mighty Mouse, Danger Mouse, Roger Mouse, Freddy Mouse, any of the, you get any mouse, and then you come to a guy like me, and I go, oh, I go to Ellen, who's got distribution, and Ellen knows she can sell Danger Mouse in Germany, New York, or Germany, Spain, and France, and you're half the way done there. You got you still after. 20, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a 26 years of producing. Um, it's still the same big 10 territories with the exception of China, but you're going to get screwed in China anyway. So just take what they offer you and know you're not going to get any over because they're going to fuck you. Excuse me, but they do. Bad business practices, horrible business practices. Um, and um, get what you, if you can get Danger Mouse, Get your tax incentive. Go to a state that doesn't have a transferable tax credit, but has a refundable tax credit or a rebate. Meaning, when you're done and your 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 audit is done, they're going to give you back a check for thirty three cents for every dollar you spent. So you got that thirty three cents, and then you know you went and you sold Italy, Germany, Spain, and France, and with that you've picked up. There's ten, ten, ten. There's another. 40 cents, because you'll get about 10% of your budget out of those ones. You've now covered 73% of your budget requirement. You still got the UK open. You still have Japan open. You still have Australia open. You still have the US open. That's a beautiful deal for us. That's kind of a standard deal where we look at it and go, great, we can do that, no problem. So I mean, it's not a one size fits all, but it's, it's kind of that, that thinking, you know? Or if you can go and you can go to a, um, oh, goodness gracious, what's the name? Um, Lionsgate's division, I'm looking for the name. They, they do the ubi Shubi spooky stuff. I can't think of it right now. I want to say Grindhouse, Grindhouse. And they come and they buy the domestic out of you in perpetuity, but they give you 40% of your negative cost. And you go, great, I can do that. I can go to Ohio where it's a 35% tax refund and out of the 35 i know i'll net at least 28 percent between their 40 and that 28 you're up to 68 percent and now even if you're going to complement that with equity to get to the 75 that we require you only seven percent of your budget is in uh equity and if you're making it for a million that's 70 grand that's you know that's a layup that's a chip shot so yeah. that that's sort of and i gotta tell you you know it the, the distributors I go to are folks that I've known, I've known for, God, I'm getting old, but I've known for 20, 30 years. And, and I know what territories they can sell. I know what sort of things are, are you know, hit the, hit the bell for them. And I know which ones that are gonna pay on the overages, even though you may have a collection account, you know, uh, and use a third party where all the money goes into. Be careful with distributors. They're always cutting funky deals and, uh, you know, slipping shit behind your back. So just be careful there. Perfect. That's really great general, but specific information at the same time. So I appreciate uh, look, that. 
if you come, you know, Jeff had asked earlier, and I think Jane had asked earlier, really what, what sort of rings the bell for us. If you come to us and you've got a project and the budget's between 500 and 5 million, and you've got, you know, 65 percent of it covered off to meet our 75 we're going to hop on that like a chicken on a june bug because that sings to us that means you know you not only want to get your film done but you understand what what risk mitigation we must achieve in order to you know be able to spend the money and get the money back make sense perfect yes totally cool. excellent thank you so much sure dude <laughs> great scott thanks and Mark Schultz had a similar question, and I think you might have answered it in that question or in that answer. Uh, Mark, did you have did that answer your question? Uh, pretty much, but uh, when I used to do distribution back in the eighties with our shows, um, it was always between twenty five and thirty five percent. We we had to give to the distributor uh, for the foreign rights. We got the remainder. Uh, you know, that's, that was one interesting thing. And then of course, domestic, it depends if you were doing to distributors. Um, Mark, first film, I, one of the first films I ever produced, I got a deal with MGM. I thought, well, yeah, MGM, baby. And I got an office and I got a parking spot. Yeah. King. You know what the distribution fee was? Take a guess. You probably, you probably only got 10 cents on the dollar. I, I never even got that, but their distribution fee, 42%. 42%. That was, that was a, now the people we work with, um, pretty much across the board, we're looking at 10 for domestic and 15 for foreign. That's what you give that, you give, uh, you're giving yourself. No, we're not giving ourselves the distributors we work with. That's what they charge. That's pretty much that sort of the folks we do business with. You know, and there, there are some distributors where people come to us with deals and they go, oh, I got a distributor already. And you look and they're getting charged 25, 30 percent. It's like, what the why? And then also the distributor, which I understand they need money for their you know, marketing to go to festivals and the like. Yeah, but, yeah. <clears throat> it's just you, you want to work with a distributor who wants to work with you and go, you know what? And there is, there's one company we work with, uh, the lady that owns it and runs it, I call her the Eeyore of foreign distribution because she's always, it won't work, not going to happen. And I'd rather have somebody be rather pragmatic, maybe even pessimistic, and they come back and surprise us. And, and they say, we thought we could sell it for 20 bucks, but you know, we got a hundred, here you go. And she's, she's been doing it for years and she's got... I know she's got a go-to in Italy. She's got a go-to in France. She's got a go-to in Spain and she's got a go-to in the UK. So she can sell those territories that covers that much of the nut. I got the foreign over here. I've got the rest of domestic. I've, I've then got, you know, Japan, Australia, other territories where we can get overages and, and life is good. So you're getting more than 65% is what you're saying. Oh yeah. But, but, but we know out of the gate with Ellen, you know, we've got our tax incentive. We like Ohio. Ohio's got a good amount of crews. They've got a tax. It's a it's a refund. It's not a transferable credit. You're talking about producing, not not after the product is finished. Correct. Correct. But I, um, that that we know we can mitigate our rest. And when it's finished, then getting it out there, we've got somebody that we know they can sell these territories, and we know we've got an extremely high likelihood of earning our money back. I remember Daily Variety used to put out a list of which each country was going to pay for what types of product. For instance, if it was a doc feature length documentary versus a, uh, a, a, a horror film, et cetera, this is what the, each territory listed by country, what they were paid, 35,000, 100,000, you know, for certain documentaries or feature films, even there wasn't a lot. Uh, and as, as they say, most movies don't make a lot of money. So you're lucky to get anything. So Hopefully people, people have no idea of the ratios. They don't understand it. It's something like 10,000 scripts are written, you know, uh, a, a thousand are considered to be made 500 are made. And of the 500 are made, maybe a hundred actually have theatrical distribution. And of those hundred that are in the theater, maybe 20 actually make money. It, it's a, it's a shit business. Yep. yep. You can't be doing it for the money. Yes. <laughs> we, we did it. We did it. We did a lot of, uh, Educational videos and made quite a, quite a nice stir doing that ourselves, but then that was a lot of self-distribution and 
back in the VHS days, back in the uh, 80s. Yeah, 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 exactly. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Um, I think that's a wrap on the questions. Uh, Any other last comments we have? No, I think I'd be curious going back to when he's talking about his experience in front of a live audience. What do you think of laugh tracks? (laughs) <laughs> you know when it's well we can all tell you know when it's an editor sitting there and they press the button and go ah, 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 ah. but then look gary goldberg family ties right the executive producer the creator i know there were times he was standing down in front of the audience and when the joke was told people will laugh when other people are laughing and they feel encouraged and they feel there's a lot of you know folks that think it's funny but if they hear somebody else laugh, that that induces them to laugh. And Gary, you would always hear Gary on the tape show going, ah, 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 ah. but so that is somewhat of a laugh track and somewhat he's trying to help. Or maybe he actually thought it was funny. But, you know, there's so many. I, I stopped watching sitcoms. And look, it happens as we all get older. You know, remember when we were young and our parents would say, well, there's nothing on TV. And we're like, oh, no, there's Gilligan's Island and there's F Troop and there's, you know, Hey, Coach Junction, what do you mean there's great shows on? Um, as we get older and they, you know, they try to appeal to a younger audience. And part of the beauty of the proliferation of cable, the proliferation of streaming services, is now there are shows that are made and produced specifically to cater to old keezers like you and me, you know. Um, do you remember that show, Men of a Certain Age? Did you see that? It's great. It's about men of a certain age, guys in their, you know, late 40s, mid 50s. And it spoke to us. There's that other show that uh, Jane Fonda does with Lily Tomlin. What is it? Frankie and uh, Frankie and what's the name of it, Ellen? Uh, Grace, isn't it? Grace and Frankie? Grace and Frankie or whatever. And that's truly to gear towards women that are even not no longer in menopause, (laughs) that are past menopause, that are past the 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 philandering cheating, slimy ex-husband. And I love that that was made to appeal to women of that age. So, and they don't need laugh tracks. So I'm not really a fan of laugh tracks. I, I, I'd rather it be a, a visceral, natural reaction, you know? And, but I I do love with, you know, as much as I curse Netflix and Amazon and, and Apple, um, there's some of the shows that they make actually appeal to gray haired guys like me. And I like that. Hey, I used to be young and hip, damn it. <laughs> I, I, I can attest to that. <laughs> I was on Tiger Beat, Jeff, okay? <laughs> I got it right here. I can show you. Yeah, so it was, it was just a few years ago, right? We, oh, yeah. Yeah. Her yeah, yeah. niece said, said that, you know, you see my hair. It's been, although it's been like that since my 30s, but he, my niece said, Uncle Jeff's hair is not white. It's just the he's the blondest in the family. <laughs> I took that we as love a that kid. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, Scott, this has been absolutely fabulous. This has been so good, and I know everyone has just had a great time. Um, any last words of wisdom before we uh, we wrap it? Never give up. Never, never, never. As, as old as we all are, you, you, Jeff, you know, Robin, you know, Ellen, you know. We've all been through crazy shit, you know, you, you, you fall off the horse, get up, dust yourself off and get back on, keep riding. And don't let anybody rain on your parade, be as obtuse and as idiosyncratic as you want to be, and dance your own music, dance naked and dance like nobody's watching. <laughs> and we've, we've all danced some. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. You know, you, you, it's a great, and I'm, I'm dead serious. If you want to start and finding a way that we can, make an alliance and be, be a funding source for you guys and a distribution source and, and really, you know, looking at films outside of the Hollywood environment seems to be more fruitful for us. And you guys are certainly outside of that. So let's talk about that more. Let's have that dialogue offline and see if we can nurture that, uh, that aspect of our relationship. Okay. I suspect there's many people here who would like that very much. Sorry to interrupt Jeff. It's okay. I just was saying, just going to tell Scott, thanks again. It's just great catching up with him after, after these few years. So well, it's I, only been a couple, lad. <laughs> yeah, it's only, it's only been a couple. Hey, you're, you're back. 
What was that that bar that we all used to go to down the street from ACC? Oh, the Trading Post. Yes, let's go. Where there my car got wrecked. Drinks. Robin, meet us there. Come on, Ellen. <laughs> we would shift bars every semester. Yeah. We would adopt them, and then we would stand on tables and sing and do all, create all sorts of mayhem. But it seemed like with every show, there was a different bar that we would somehow infest. I think that's a good word for it. Of course, Robin was always very civil and very demure. She was. <laughs> Some somebody had to had to be sure we we behaved. Yeah. More or less. All right. Thank thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, everybody. Great questions. And and let's let's uh let's keep this dialogue going. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And when, once you. things are launched, let's uh let's get you back on and uh and talk some more about this. Beautiful. Thank you, brother. Okay. Thank Have you. a good night. Stay Take safe. Care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much.